As genealogists, we often reveal skeletons in the closet, but also busts myths that persist in our family lore. A viewer named Matthew Friend asked, how does one deal with family myths that are simply not true? I know I can dismiss it, but nobody else seems to want to let it die off. Matthew's question is one that we should all consider so that we can know how to handle these false legends in our family tree. But let's take a page out of the history and journalism fields. Acknowledge what is known, critique it, and then put forth the truth as far as current evidence substantiates. Howdy, I'm Devin Noelle, the author of a memoir, two published family histories, 60 scrapbooks, and 120 drafts in the process of becoming books. My goal on writing your family history is to help you quickly write non-boring family histories to share your legacy with your loved ones. When I took my children to Washington, D.C., I mentioned a historical legend that I heard about Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> Can you guess what it is? I believe that he wrote the Gettysburg Address on the back of a napkin. Apparently, my understanding of the myth is mistaken because others thought he wrote it on the back of an envelope. As it turns out, neither is true because Lincoln spent many weeks carefully drafting the speech he was to give at Gettysburg on November 19th, 1863. He had an invitation to speak as early as August. He thus had plenty of time to devote to writing this speech, even discussing drafts with associates. A history of the Gettysburg Address should detail when and how he wrote this speech without including false myths. But what's interesting about this story is when someone takes time to discuss how myths developed around the various legends. For instance, Apparently, the myth dates back to at least 1866 when Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote that she had seen the president jot down the speech in only a few moments. Now we have a story with Harriet Beecher Stowe and Andrew Carnegie's participation, as you can see on screen, and that helped spread the story. The story takes on a new life and involves more context of the time. One has to wonder why the two legendary figures would falsify their story. Additionally, why would Mary Raymond Shipman Andrews publish the myth in the perfect tribute without validating its authenticity? That being said, what do we do with our family stories when we're writing a book? Family myths tell you much more about what your family wishes to pass down to future generations. I invite you to read a fascinating article about family myths and their effect. According to the article, the purpose of family myths includes protecting, defending, and organizing the family structure, keeping family secrets safe, and defining who is the black sheep or the role model. Most myths will reveal the image the family has of itself, cover up a reality the family refuses to accept, which could be negative or simply boring, and how the family relates to culture. Finally, the article suggests family myths fall into three categories, harmony, apology, and reparation, and salvation. This article is a great read and I hope that I've given you enough details so that you'll read it. The link is in the show notes. However, take all of the points into consideration. Then perhaps you'll see why including myths, no matter how small, may capture the essence of your family's beliefs and desires through their stories. As genealogists, we want to set the record straight, but there is a place for the facts and legends. The only question is how do we do it? Before we can determine whether the, to include or exclude the family myth from our genealogy books, we must first analyze the legend. While we cannot speak with the originator of the family stories, we can consider when did the myth begin? Who might have started the legend? 
What was their objective in telling the story? Harmony, apology, or salvation? If we can analyze these questions, we will know how to handle the myth. Then we can take one of the following approaches. Ignore it, mention it, but dismiss it within the story, include the myth and its refutation in an appendix. Each option has its merits, so there is no hard and fast rule on this topic. Many genealogists will choose to ignore a family myth, particularly if it's simply a minor factual error. Suppose family members believe their great-grandfather was J.T. Smith, but he was actually J.P. Smith. You discovered the mistake stems from a census transcription error. In your story, you can use the correct name and ignore the error and move on. Or perhaps your relative was born in Cut and Shoot, Texas, not Conroe, which is a neighboring town. Just mention the correct birth location in your story and ignore Conroe, which others had previously used. However, you could say that Cut and Shoot is six miles northeast of Conroe and 45 mi miles north of Houston. That's not exactly ignoring the myth that your relative was born in Conroe rather than Cut and Shoot, but merging the myth into a setting description. The simpler the myth, the easier it is to ignore. But what about this one from Legacy Tree Genealogist? In the article, Do Family Legends Have a Place in Genealogical Research? Professional Research Debunked a Story that mentioned a father was very wealthy and owned a castle in Victorian England. The story went on to say that grandma had so displeased her father by associating with the Mormons that he made her and her family live in the furthest room in the castle, isolated from the rest of the family, and had left these instructions in his will. In actuality, there was no castle. The father was a shoemaker who owned four tenement buildings. There is no evidence that the father excluded the daughter from his will due to her religious beliefs. If we were to write this story, we could ignore the family legend entirely about the castle only in father who disowned his daughter. But of course, we better include all the source citations that support the research and debunking of the family myth. However, perhaps including the myth would convey the legend's aspirations or the apology function. Thus, you might wish to utilize the following two approaches instead. Mention of the family legend, but dismiss it within the story you're writing. Matthew, who originally posted the question, said he learned that his great-grandparents' four children died in a tragic event. Family members insist they died via a choking on popcorn story, while he said, I will write this story with those facts in mind, but will not mention the family story. I have another suggestion. Please note the dates and names are fictional to protect the family, but share a clear example. Family members believe that Janice, Sarah, Michael, and Daryl died from choking on popcorn while at the movie theater, but that doesn't seem to be the case. According to an article in the Houston Chronicle on 13 March 1913, the four children came to a more tragic death. The article goes on to detail what happened to the young children, and you can now tell what happened to the children. So that's a way to mention the story people believed, but then transition to what the facts are. Another viewer has a story that would fall into the include but dismiss category. According to Christine Bassett, she has a story about some changes in her heritage that other family members will need to know. My great grandmother was an Irish Catholic who married a French Jew. Apparently, he watched her walk by where she, he worked, was attracted, and wondered where she was going. He followed her and found she was on her way to church. 
Long story short, they married much to the disappointment of both religious families. But they seem to have lived happily ever after. However, sometime after their first child was born, my grandfather changed his name to sound less Jewish. Therefore, the remaining children have a different surname. You can see why this is important. Christine says it's difficult to research their Irish, French, Italian family history without knowing this information. She is correct. The only thing I would do to make this story more compelling is to wrap the details in a chronological sharing of the story rather than a two-paragraph summary. Now, I'm not suggesting she hasn't done this already. I'm just advocating you reveal these details as you write about the family being displeased by the couple's marriage. Then the birth of the first child takes place with his Jewish surname. Then discuss the second child's birth and why the, that kid and further siblings have the different surname. This approach refers to a previous video that discusses how to show don't tell us the story, but at least you're sharing the family myths in the story. Then at the story's conclusion, hopefully we can see that the couple lived happily ever after. If you have a more complicated family myth, you may want to leverage the appendix section to debunk the story. For instance, my immigrant great-grandfather Joseph Geisler has a family legend about his death recorded in my great aunt Margie Wasson's scrapbook. Henry's father, Joseph, was on horseback and rode into Fort Hayes. Guards yelled halt. He only spoke German and as the story went, didn't understand. So the guard shot him and he died. There are a couple of problems with the story, not the least of which the word for halt in German is halt. In addition to this myth, there's another suggestion that Joseph was an unnamed stabbing victim in a newspaper story about Carl Beisner. My cousin found this story when he discovered Carl was buried the same day as Joseph. Could Carl and Joseph be connected through the story? Within the book's main body, I mentioned Joseph's death within the context of the time. He died four days after the Battle of Gettysburg. The day before his death, bulletins arrived in Columbus. The news items stated that the Union Army should receive high praise and honor, but the scope of the loss created great anxiety in Columbus. Additionally, he died three days after Confederate General Morgan's raid started its assault on Ohio, which added to the tension in the city. When sorting all of the details, I placed the discussion of his death myth in the appendix section of the book to walk readers step by step through the analysis of the family legend and where current research stands. Thus, I recommend that Matthew's second story implement this strategy, particularly because he says this family myth is all over the internet like a raging fire in a dry forest. A sea captain who brought his family from England to America. This captain and his wife had 13 children. The family left England on his ship and came near their destination, but it wrecked nearby. The family story insists that the sea captain died saving his family who all lived and his widow took care of his family alone. At the turn of the 20th century, many researchers invalidated the story because they found no connection between the widow and the sea captain. Instead, the father was Swedish and came to America. He came in the mid 17th century, got married, had 13 children, he died in his late 60s with a thousand acres of land to his name. However, he only gave the land to his wife, not his children. As such, after his death, his wife sold off and divided the land among her children. 
Matthew believes whoever wrote that English sea captain story was trying to cover up their true heritage. Was it really such a bad story? Were they trying to connect to England and sea captains and make it more exciting? I don't know. But if I were writing the story, I would start with the entire life of this Swedish father. When I reached a section of his death, I would proceed to discuss his death and then the probate information, not mentioning the sea captain stuff at all. Readers will know this man is Swedish, had acreage, and died in his 60s. In the appendix, I would have a section called The Myth of the Sea Captain. <laughs> if the story ranges far and wide, discuss it in the book's appendix. Add an analysis of why this story isn't true after you include it. You've explained the insight into the myth, debunked it, and presented an accurate version of this man's life and death. Hopefully now you have enough insight into the options for handling false stories in your family tree. The more involved, widespread, and complicated the myth, the more you lean towards the appendix option. The fewer persons who know of a legend and the easier to refute, the more you can ignore it. But remember, Family myths have a purpose. Otherwise, they wouldn't persist. Determine what the purpose is and you'll capture more of your heritage, even if you have to be the one to tell your relatives the myths are false. So you have some homework to do. Run along and get started. And then come back and share what you've done, get some feedback and support. Hey, could you do me a favor? Like this video and leave a comment. It really helps the channel grow and reach more future family history writers. Thanks. Now go back to writing or learning the next valuable family history tip right up there.